All right, so today what we're going to do is finish up the valuation that we had started on Monday for Coca-Cola. And for those of you <clears throat> that may have struggled with your last homework assignment, I posted on Canvas in the Coke folder, the KO folder, a file called valuation model KO part 2.xls. So you're either welcome to, if you completed the homework assignment last Wednesday, use that. If you had any challenges, you're welcome to use that file, which is where we left off in last Wednesday's class. That's where we're going to pick up in the valuation here today. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So to summarize where we left off, we created a valuation model that forecasted 11 years worth of income statements and balance sheets which gave us 11 years worth of economic statement data for Coca-Cola. Today what we want to do is take that economic forecast and turn it into a valuation. Okay, And we're going to do two valuations. We're going to do an enterprise discounted cash flow valuation and then we're going to do an economic profit valuation. Now if we go back in our lecture notes to lecture note 4, When we were talking through Enterprise DCF, there was an example that McKinsey gave on an Enterprise DCF valuation that they had practiced with Home Depot. And I said, this is a format that we're going to follow in the class. <clears throat> Though it looked like an innocuous slide from the book, it's actually their process for doing an Enterprise DCF valuation. So <clears throat> what we're going to do is we're going to basically add this tab to our model. So that's where we're going to begin. <clears throat> so I'm going to take the valuation file where we left off, call this part two, and I'm going to add a new sheet at the end of the model. <clears throat> and I'm going to name this sheet DCF, or Discounted Cash Flow Valuation. Make it a little bit bigger <clears throat> so you can see the text. All right, <clears throat> so <clears throat> the first part of an enterprise DCF valuation is to value the operating cash flows. And specifically, it's the free cash flow forecast that matters. Well, it's nice because in our model, in the CFI tab, we have forecasted the free cash flow of the company for the next 11 years. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that forecast and put it into this new tab. And I'm going to make this tab more portrait rather than landscape just so I can fit it all if we ever print it out on one page. Okay. So across the top, we're going to be looking for the free cash flow. And down the rows, we're going to do the years. Now again, I want to make these relative references. So I'm going to do a reference to the first forecast year. I'll pull out the ratios tab which is 2014, so cell H1, and I'm going to do equals previous year plus 1, because again I want the model to automate the updating of the years when I update the model. I'm going to copy this down through 2023. All right. So I need the first 10 years as what we're calling the defined forecast period for valuation. Right. So specifically, I need the first 10 years, year by year, forecast for free cash flow. So I'm going to get that <clears throat> off of the CFI tab. So for 2014, free cash flow, and again, for valuation purposes, always includes goodwill, okay, investments in goodwill, <clears throat> would be H12. So equals from the CFI tab 2014 free cash flow, which is H12. 2015 I12, 2016 J12, 2017 K12. 
2018 L12. Again, equals 2018 L12. 2020, M12, 2021, 2022, 2023. No. All right, so H I J K L M N O P Q. All right, I'm going to format this. Same format. All right, so those are the first 10 years of forecasted free cash flows. <clears throat> now, I then need to present value these. All right, so I'm going to multiply them by a discount factor. Discount factor is 1 divided by 1 plus R to the N. All right, in this case, R is the discount rate, and we're going to use the WAC as the discount rate. So the discount factor equals 1 divided by left paren 1 plus the WAC, and the WAC is on the assumption screen. Assumptions B4. And I'm going to make that an absolute reference. Dollar sign B, dollar sign 4. So I'm going to copy that down. And I'm going to copy and paste that down for all 10 years. And then it's 1 plus r to the power of n or t for number of years, number of periods. So in this case, 2015 would be squared. 2016 would be cubed, which is shift 6 is the caret third power. Fourth year to the fourth power. Fifth year to the fifth power. Sixth, seventh, eight, nine, and ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. So that would then get me my discounted free cash flow which equals the free cash flow times the discount factors. All right, so <clears throat> all we've done is we've just basically present valued the forecast of the free cash flow. All right, that comes from the model, that comes from the CFI, that comes from our forecasted income statements and balance sheets. Right, So that is the year-by-year -year forecast of free cash flow discounted to present value using the WAC. So multiply by the discount factors for each of the years into a present value. And then I'm going to sum up those 10 years. And that will be the present value of free cash flow for 10 years. All right, so that's the 10-year value for Coke that we are estimating at this time. Okay, questions? All right, <clears throat> so we're saying that Coke is worth a little over $50 billion for the next decade, all right? But then we have to forecast the stock for years 11 going forward into the continuing value period. So if you remember what the book said about this is it said we always want to use a T plus one period for continuing value. 
right? Well, that t plus 1 is year 11. That's why we forecast 11 years. So no matter what your forecast is, always add one more year to your forecast for the start of the continuing value period. So for us, t plus 1, time period plus 1, continuing value period start, is year 11, which is 2024. Okay, so I want to do a continuing value for Coke starting in 2024. Now again, going back to our lecture notes last week, this was the formula, the key value driver formula, that we said we were going to use for the continuing value period. And it has four elements to it. First, it has no plat in T plus 1, okay, which is our 2024 no plat. It's got a RONIC, which is the 2024 ROIC, continuing ROIC. It's got a WAC, which we're using the same WAC, and it's got a G, which is the long-term growth rate. Okay? So those are the four assumptions that are going to go into our continuing value formula. So what I want to do, just to put it all in one place, so I'm going to go to my Assumptions tab, and that's where I'm going to put in my assumptions. So I'm going to have a continuing value no plat, a continuing value ROIC or RONIC. I'm going to have a continuing value G. <clears throat> and I already have my WAC. Right? So I'm just going to build the formula all in one place. Well, my continuing value no plat which is my year 11 no plat, equals from the TII tab, 2024 no plat, which is cell R4. My continuing value ROIC, very important, comes off of the beginning of year economic profit tab. It's my 2024 Return on invested capital, again, always after goodwill for valuation purposes. So Q15. And my continuing value G, we're going to start with 3%. All right. Now, the reason I pick 3% is because this semester we're primarily valuing U.S. companies and major U.S. and European companies are probably going to grow at about the rate of the economy long term. So hence, we're picking about 3%. All right, now, we can vary that assumption later, but that's just a starting assumption that we're going to make. Now, we know that G can't be higher than the WAC. Right? It's the long-term growth rate in cash flow. All right, so it's bounded by the WAC, and we're going to at least start out with an assumption of 3%. Okay? So now I'm ready to start building in my continuing value formula. So I need to put that formula into that cell with the correct order of operations. So equals left paren from the assumptions tab no plat times left paren 1 minus the growth divided by the ROIC, right paren, right paren, divided by left paren, WAC minus growth, right paren. A little over 110 billion. So basically, using the continuing value growth formula, we're saying that Coke is worth from year 11 into perpetuity approximately $110 billion. Now, the continuing value growth formula, key value driver formula, actually includes a discount rate. Right? It's got the whack in it. It's already discounting. So it actually looks at this as a present value as of the beginning of year 11, which is the beginning of our continuing value period, which for all intents and purposes, January 1st, year 11, is equivalent to December 31st, year 10. Okay, 
So what we're going to do is we need to bring this back to a true present value. So I'm going to use the year 10 discount factor, which is the December 31st discount factor for year 10, and apply it to the January 1st year 11 discount. And that's going to bring this back to a present value today. So what I don't want to do is I don't want to double discount year 11, which is why I'm using the year 10 discount factor, because year 11 has already been discounted by the key value driver formula. Common mistake people make is to double discount that year. We don't want to do that. Okay, So that gets us to a discounted free cash flow for the continuing value as a present value of about $52 billion. Yes? In this equation? Again, I'm just following the, the same order of operations that was in the, the chart in the book. Okay? So if I then add up these two values, the value for the first 10 years of free cash flow and the 11 plus years of free cash flow, then I get the operating value of Coke, which equals approximately 102 billion. So we're saying <clears throat> that if our assumptions in the model were to come true about the income statement and balance sheet, then Coke would be worth about 102 billion dollars of operating value today based on those free cash flow forecasts. What we've done, going back to the Home Depot illustration, is basically gotten to the 62,694. The operating value for Coke. The operating value for Home Depot. Same process. Now we're not going to do the mid-year adjustment factor. That I told you is a process step that we're going to skip. Okay. So what we're going to then do is add in the non- operating value of Coke. So we need the value of the non-operating assets. So I'm going to go back to Excel and the non-operating assets are listed on TFI. <clears throat> that when we rearranged the balance sheet, we listed the non-operating assets. And we have three major non-operating asset categories. We have excess cash, we have non-operating assets, net of the non-operating liabilities, and we have long-term investments. So I'm going to list those straight from the TFI on this page. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the last reported year's value, the December 31st, 2013 value, and those are the non-operating assets that Coke currently has. And they're already in present value. So I'm going to take the 2013 excess cash, the 2013 non-operating assets, and the 2013 long-term investments. <clears throat> and when I add those non-operating assets, which are already in a present value because we're using the current amount for Coke to the operating value, then that would give us a forecast of the enterprise value of Coke of approximately 145 billion and change. So we're just following our formula following the same process that McKinsey did for Home Depot. They took the operating assets, they added in the non-operating value, they got the enterprise value. Mm -hmm. Same process here. Ones plus twos equals enterprise value. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the one adjustment that we're going to make to this is that cash is cash. So I don't really have to worry about adjusting the value for cash because that's probably a pretty realistic value for cash. Non-operating assets, they're probably listed at what they're worth off the balance sheet, so I probably don't adjust those. The one thing that I might have to adjust is the long-term investments. So right now, Yahoo is a worthless company 
with the exception that they made a good strategic investment in a company called Alibaba. And they bought Alibaba a while back. They funded them when they were early. And now Alibaba is about to go public in one of the largest IPOs in history. And Yahoo owns about 20% of Alibaba. And that 20% stake is worth over $20 billion at current market prices. So Yahoo is going to get a lot of value because they own a huge stake in this company that's about to go public. But here's the thing. <clears throat> On Yahoo's balance sheet today, none of that value is represented because the accountants make Yahoo report the value of Alibaba at historical cost. Okay, So if you look at Yahoo's balance sheet, you don't see anything about the true value of Alibaba. You won't see that until Yahoo sells the stake. So here's the thing. <clears throat> the long-term investment value that we put in for Coke or another company may not be representative of the true market value of the long-term investment. And so if we were valuing a company like Yahoo, we would completely misprice them if we didn't understand that most of their stock price is actually the value of this other company that they own. Because it's not represented on their balance sheet. The accountants do not let us mark up to a true market value the value of our long-term investments. So what we're going to do to accommodate our model is under the Assumptions tab, I'm going to add an assumption called the price to book multiple of long-term investments. <clears throat> and right now I'm just going to put it at a 1. Make that yellow. And I'm going to multiply that price to book multiple by the value of the long-term investments. So for example, if I were to say that Coke's investments were worth 20 times what they originally paid for it in market value, then it would adjust my valuation accordingly as a what if. Right? So what I know is the accountants will write down the value if an investment loses value, but they will not write up a value if the market value exceeds the original price. So I know that the long-term investments on the balance sheet are probably a reasonable floor, but it's not a ceiling. So again, I'm going to leave that at 1 as a multiplier. <clears throat> so again, if I know nothing about the company, and I, I should try and do some research on this. I'm at least going to put the book value on there, because I know that's a floor, but I know that the ceiling could be a little bit higher. And the multiple allows me to make that adjustment later. All right, that gets me the enterprise value forecast for Coke. Right? Now, following the process, to get to an equity value, I have to subtract all of the debt, debt equivalents, and non-common stakeholders that have to be paid before the common shareholders get their money. So off the TFI, where I've listed the stakeholders, I have to pay off the retirement-related liabilities. I have to pay off the interest-bearing debt, I have to pay off the preferred shareholders, I have to pay off the minority interest, and off the assumptions tab, I have to pay off the operating leases before my common shareholders are paid. So those are the four stakeholders off the balance sheet. Retirement-related liabilities, interest-bearing debt, preferred stock, and minority interest. And the fifth stakeholder is from the footnotes, which is the operating leases that have to be paid before the common shareholders can get paid. Now, these aren't in order of priority. Just happen to put them in this order. But basically, all of these people are going to get paid before the common shareholders. So <clears throat> that will then get me a common equity value forecast for Coke. 
So for the retirement related liabilities, again, we're going to use the 2013 retirement related liabilities. Equals from the TFI, 2013, which is already in a present value, the last reported year, retirement related liabilities, the interest bearing debt, the 2013 preferred stock, if they have any, 2013 minority interest, and from the assumptions, the 2013 operating leases. If I take my enterprise value and subtract those five items, I get an estimate for the equity value of Coke. Questions about what we just did? All right, <clears throat> so a couple things. Yes. D19. It's uh, TFI G11, which is the long-term investments, times assumptions B9, which is the price to book multiple we just added. <clears throat> All right. So the retirement-related liabilities, the interest-bearing debt, the preferred stock, the minority interest, those all came off the balance sheet, items from Bloomberg. The one item on here that's just a little bit squishy is the operating leases. And this is also something you need to know about Bloomberg in general. So on the data BS tab, which is the balance sheet data that we exported from Bloomberg and put into our model, near the bottom is about two thirds of the way down is something called the reference items section. The reference item section of Bloomberg is basically data coming from the footnotes. All right. So what Bloomberg does is they pull the data from the 10Q and the 10Ks, and they put that into their income statement and balance sheet categories. And then they have somebody go through the footnotes and pull all the data they can from the footnotes, and they put the footnote data into the reference item section. Now, here's the thing. Not all companies report the same data in all of their footnotes, and they don't do it consistently. So therefore, you don't see the same reference items for every single company. Some have more, some have less. And as a result, they don't always show up in the same row, which is a problem for our model, Okay, because our model always has to find the data in the same row, else it's not going to be reusable else every time we bring in a new company, we're going to have to remap everything. So to get around this, what I had done, and I didn't tell you I did this last week, but I'm bringing this up now, is on the assumptions page, I took three items from the reference items footnote section, and I put them on the assumptions tab so that the model would always look here for those three reference items. And the three reference items that I'm pulling our goodwill, which is coming from the footnotes, pension obligations, which is coming from the footnotes, and operating leases, which are coming from the footnotes. And there's a manual step that we will have to do when we update the model, which I'd already done, <clears throat> where I took from the reference item section, for example, pension obligations, I selected all the pension obligations, I copied it, and then, on the assumptions, I pasted it here. I did the same with Goodwill, and I did it with the same with the last year of the operating leases. There's the most recent operating leases. Now, the one thing to know about the operating leases is if you actually read the footnotes, 
for a company's operating leases, they'll actually give you a year-by-year -year forecast for operating leases for five years. And what this number represents is a sum of five years worth of operating leases. Now, that's not quite a present value, right? Because technically, we have to adjust a five-year leases by looking at the table using a discount factor to a present value. Now, I don't think it's that far from the present value, but nonetheless, it's not a true present value. So I just want to let everybody know that the operating lease obligation that we're putting in here is a guesstimate based on the notional value of the operating leases that are owned, owed. It's not a present value of the operating leases. All right? And if you were truly doing the valuation, you would go through the footnotes, you do the year-by-year -year operating lease adjustments to get them to a present value. All right? But this is going to be close enough for our class benefit to do this and at least get a, a close value for Coke stock. Like I said, it's not going to make that much of a difference to the valuation because I'll also tell you, a lot of people skip this step in general. They don't even put in the operating leases when they do the valuations. So the fact that we even have it is a positive. As I said, we can more formally do it, but we're just putting in a five-year sum of operating leases. We're not present valuing this number. Okay, We're using the value that Bloomberg's giving us, which is not a present value. All right, so that's the operating lease number. So again, after all of these liabilities are paid and non-common equity numbers are paid, what's left is the common equity value for Coke. So to get to a share price, we then need to know the shares outstanding. And that would get us a forecasted share price. Now, <clears throat> in Bloomberg, the quickest way to get a forecast or shares outstanding, again, if we're looking up Coca-Cola, is to go to the DES section, the security description, and it's multi-pages, but the first page in the profile right down here is the shares outstanding. So that's just the quickest, easiest way to get the current shares outstanding for a company. Four billion four hundred and five point nine million. Now I have taken a screenshot of this file and I posted it to Canvas and it's called K-O-D-E-S. Ticker symbol, Bloomberg short code. Just so it's easy when you redo this to remember, oh, that's the short code I need, D-E-S, for description. Okay, that's how you get right back to that screen. But <clears throat> basically, the number that we need is 4405.9. But I'm not going to put it here. I'm going to put it here on the assumption screen. because I'm going to change it when we change companies. So if I put it on the DCF screen, and every time I change the company, i got to remember to go to the DCF screen. Put in the assumption screen, it's all in one place. So 4405.9, again, just making sure. the right number, 4405.9. Okay, so back to my DCF equals from my assumptions forecasted share price equals common equity value divided by shares outstanding 2388 a share. So what this says <clears throat> is that if the income statements and balance sheets that we forecast when we started building the model come true, Coke should be worth about $23.88 a share. And on our ratios page, that meant that Coke saw its revenue fall 2.4% a year going forward. So if they keep shrinking a little, they're going to be worth $24 a share. <clears throat> In the real world today, Coke is trading at... 
around $39 a share, a little under $39. So obviously the market doesn't think they're going to keep shrinking at 2% a year. Right? Now, this is where we're going to go on Wednesday. Okay? On Wednesday, we're going to get into the art of valuation, and we're going to start changing the model to figure out why they're valued at $39 a share. So let's say instead of shrinking 2%, they grew 2%. Don't do this. This is Wednesday. But notice that our share price is now 34. Or let's go back here to ratios, grow 3%. Now I'm getting really close to the current share price of Coke. All right. So that's going to be the next step, which is how do we change the model to change the share price? All right, but we don't want to do that yet, so don't, don't do what I just did. Make sure that as we finish building the model, you're still leaving it shrinking, and you're matching the 2388 share price. So we want to finish the model before we get into the forecast. Okay? But nonetheless, what we've just done is we've set up the model to do an enterprise discounted cash flow valuation of a company. All right, in, this, in this example's code. All right, questions about anything we've done so far? All right, next, <clears throat> we're going to have to do a second valuation of Coke using the economic profit methodology. As I said earlier this semester that we were going to do two valuations, and the second was the economic profit valuation methodology. Now, what's different about this methodology is how we calculate the operating value. Everything else is the same except the operating value calculation. So, to save us time, rather than creating the entire worksheet from scratch, because three quarters of the worksheet is not going to change, we're going to take the worksheet we just created, we're going to clone it. We're going to make a copy of it. So the easiest way to do that in Excel is holding your mouse over the worksheet that you just created, the title, right click with your mouse, move or copy, create a copy, and move it to the end. So the last tab in your model should now say DCF valuation and should have a number two after it. So all we've done is just clone that tab. So we create a copy of that tab. Make sure you do create a copy. Okay. Then we're going to rename this by just clicking on it to EP for economic profit valuation. So we now have two tabs in our model that we've added, the DCF valuation and the copy of the DCF valuation, which has been renamed the EP for economic profit valuation. Okay, so we have that as a second tab. Okay. Now, <clears throat> what's different about the economic profit valuation is instead of using the forecast for free cash flows, it's going to use the forecast for economic profits. So on the EP valuation tab, Change this to economic profit. Same discount factors, but instead of having discounted free cash flows, we're going to have the discounted economic profits. Um, clear these. And we're going to have present value of the economic profits for 10 years. That'll be a different continuing value formula. All right. So economic profit, remember, is the one period change in value for a company. Okay. So we've already forecasted the one period change in value for a company because we actually have a tab in our model, bless you, called economic profit. Now there's two economic profit tabs. One's EPBOY, 
the other is EPEOI, and the one that's going to be important for us to use is the BOI tab. Do not use the EOI tab, because if we use the beginning of year BOI tab, we will get an exact valuation match. If we use the EOI economic profit data, we will come close, and we want to be exact. That's why we're going to use the BOI. So I'm going to go a step further, and I'm going to actually put a little parentheses BOY after the economic profit, just to remind ourselves that we want to use the BOY data in this tab. So specifically, if we go to the EPBOY tab, we want the economic profit after goodwill, so it's the last row, and we want it for the forecast period, 2014 forward. So again, same process, just copy. 2014 equals EPBOY 2014, which is G23. 2015 for the EPBOY is H23. 2016 EPBOY is I23. 2017 EPBOY is J23. 2018 BOY is K. 2019 is L23. 2020 is M. 2021 is N. 2022 is O, 2023 is P. So just making sure, B-O-Y-G, B-O-Y-H, B-O-Y-I, B-O-Y-J, B-O-Y-K, B-O-Y-L, B-O-Y-M, N, O, P. All right? So that's my first 10 years of forecasted economic profits. <clears throat> so the change in value that we're forecasting for Coca-Cola is 33 billion and change for the first decade. Then we're gonna say the change in value for continuing value. And what's different about the economic profit model is we're then gonna add that to the beginning invested capital. The invested capital at the start of the period, start of the valuation. So I'm going to need my starting invested capital, which is my 2013 invested capital, equals from my TFI. 2013 operating invested capital including goodwill. Again, for valuation purposes, always including goodwill. So that the operating value is going to be the sum of three things. The first 10 years of economic profit, the continuing value of economic profit, and the starting invested capital. That is going to be the operating value that we're predicting for Coca-Cola. So the only thing we're missing right now is the continuing value. But here's the thing. When we solve for the continuing value, I already know that my DCF valuation equals... 102459.02, that's what I need this number to be. Because they have to match. In fact, that's your final exam, is to show, using both methods, you get these two numbers to match. So that there needs to be a difference between the two of zero. There can't be any difference. In fact, I can already tell you that this number needs to be that number. 
I can back solve for it because those three things add to that answer. And by the way, the TAs are smart enough to figure this out on your final exam as well. So if you plug on the final exam for this, you get zero credit. You have to actually solve for it. Okay. So how do we solve for the continuing value of economic profit? Well, just as there's a formula for the continuing value of the free cash flow, key value drivers formula, there's a formula for the continuing value economic profit. It's talked about in the book and lecture note eight. It's that formula. So what we have to do is put that formula into our Excel model with the correct order of operations, which can be a little tricky. So hopefully we'll get this right in the first try. So <clears throat> there's one additional item that was not in the key value drivers formula that's in this formula, which is the continuing value economic profit forecast. So specifically, I'm going to go back to my assumptions tab. Continuing value economic profit, which is from the BOY tab, very important to use the BOY one, the 2024 economic profit after goodwill. So Q23. The 4065.59. So those are the five things that are in that formula. Right? So what I'm now going to do is I'm going to put those five things in the correct order of operations in, and hopefully I get it right in the first try, especially since I'm recording this as a video. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> following the formula, economic profit divided by WAC equals, from the assumptions tab, start again, equals left paren, from the assumptions tab, economic profit divided by WAC, right paren, plus left paren, no plat, times left paren, <coughs> G divided by RONIC, right paren, times left paren, RONIC minus WAC, right paren, right paren, divided by left paren, WAC times left paren, WAC minus G, right paren, right paren. I think I did it right, but Excel will tell me if I did it wrong. Let's hit enter and see what happens. Guess I got lucky. So before I show the formula, which I know you're asking for, notice these two valuations are exactly equal with a difference of zero. Not a difference of one, not a rounding error, but exact. And that's what's very important. That's the formula. Right? So again, <clears throat> this is why we're using BOY economic profits. BOY ROIC, beginning of year, BOY invested capital, because it matches exactly. If we use end of year, we get close, right? And so for our purposes, just academically, <clears throat> we want to see a match. I want you to conceptually understand that these two methods give you the same answer. This demonstrates that. You will then demonstrate to me that you see that by getting equivalences in your evaluations using the two different methodologies. <clears throat> but that's the point. Whether I'm forecasting a DCF 
or whether I'm forecasting a change in value and adding it to my starting capital, I need to get to the same result. That's what we've actually shown here for the two operating values for Coca-Cola. Questions? Save what we've done. <clears throat> All right. So, <clears throat> for the most part, we've finished setting up the valuation model for Coca-Cola, the reusable model. All right. So, again, to summarize, we forecast financials, forecast income statements and balance sheets, which gives us forecasted economic statements, which gives us forecasted free cash flows and economic profits, which we basically discount to a present value, get an operating value, add in the non-operating asset values, subtract the debt and the non-common equity values to get essentially a share price. Right? I know the model has a lot of cells and a lot of fields and a lot of worksheets, but essentially, it's a pretty straightforward process, right? And what we've actually created is a model that's used out in the wild. Like, I actually use a version of this model in the real world, right? So this is real. It doesn't, there's nothing wrong with the model. It's academically sound. It works. And it's not too dissimilar to the models that are used on Wall Street. Now, they actually make theirs more complex in certain ways and more simple in others, because they don't balance everything like we're doing here, right? They just do half the equation. Like they stop at free cash flow. They don't care about CFI. Right? I'm making you academically do that here. I think it's more useful for your benefit, but nonetheless. So that, that's where they'll simplify, but they'll make it more complex because they just won't forecast Coke as a company. They'll fo forecast the bottling division versus the people that make the syrup separately, and then they'll aggregate them all together. But, but essentially, it's the same process, same concept for doing valuation work. So what we're about to do is we're about to move from what I like to call the science of valuation to the art of valuation, which is how do we make the model make sense? How do we put in the assumptions? Because what really matters to the model is not the math. We finish the math. Now it's how do we put in realistic assumptions so that we truly understand the valuation of the company that we're evaluating. So <clears throat> that's where we're going next. right? And to better understand this, I want to go back to Bloomberg. So I'm on Coke, and another short code in Bloomberg is something called OWN, O-W-N, which gets me to the ownership screens of Bloomberg. And one of the things that you will see is that the institutions currently own 63% of Coke stocks. And actually, for a big company, this is a pretty low number. Institutional ownership is usually higher than 63% for most big companies. And that's just the nature of the world we live in today. 20, 30 years ago, individuals owned stocks. Today, companies own stocks. Institutions own them, meaning it's your mutual funds. It's your Fidelities. It's your Vanguards. It's your T. Rowe prices. It's your hedge funds. It's your banks. Right? It's basically the pension funds out there. It's the state government entities. They're the ones that are out there buying on our behalf as individuals. They now own the stocks. So the point is, <clears throat> if we really want to understand what's going to determine the stock price of Coke, it's not the individuals, but it's really the concentrated few and how they view the world of the stock that they're looking at. So again, there's another screen. Yeah. What is the average of You know, there's probably a way to do that in Bloomberg. I don't know it off the top of my head. But I'm telling you by observation, it's going to be between 70 and 80%. So <clears throat> I mean, I'll just give you an example. Pick another company, HP, like Hewlett Packard. HPQ, sorry, up here. 
uh, they are at uh, 85%. Uh, let's pick... How can it be over 100 in some, in some stuff? It's based on the float. So does that mean... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Amazon, 71%. Uh, um, I don't know. Microsoft, 72%. That's what I'm saying. Just by, I'm sure there's probably a way to screen for this in Bloomberg that I'm not aware of, uh, but I'm just telling you that by observational data for big companies, it's fewer and fewer shares are controlled by, or, or more and more shares are controlled by fewer and fewer institutions. And so that's the point. It's the institutions set the share price. They're the price setters. Yeah. It actually makes it probably less volatile. I mean, it's going to be volatile around a certain range, but you're not going to see big moves in the stock price unless the institutions try and move it. Yeah, that's what I was saying. They own, like... If you own, oh, if they, they start own, selling? Yeah, they start selling bulk of it. Then. Oh, they start selling bulk? Yeah, that moves the price. So, go back to Coke. There's another screen in here called HDS, which is holders, which will actually break out the holders. In fact, you can see Coke's biggest shareholder is a company called Berkshire Hathaway, which is who? That's Warren Buffett, and he's owned 400 million shares, and he hasn't changed that amount. But you can see the institution changes based on their last reported results, right? So every quarter they have to update their filings, and you can see that there's been a lot of institutional buying. Matter of fact, there's more institutional, big institutional buyers and sellers, which is probably why Coke, if I had to guess, How'd you get to that HDS, if I graph the price of Coke, and I look at year to date. Recently, the Coke stock has been falling. So my guess is that these holders are looking at this as a buying opportunity. So what you're actually seeing is you're seeing the institutions are probably setting a floor on Coke. And they're saying, you know what? Their stock price has been falling. Now's the time I'm going to buy. Because I actually probably think that Coke, this could be a signal that Coke might actually be a little undervalued. Now, I'm not saying that this is a class in technical indicators. This is not about short-term trading. This is about long-term intrinsic value. But nonetheless, the two eventually start to align. Why would the institutions be moving in is one of the questions we would need to address if we're valuing Coke stock. So we have to take an institutional point of view, which is where we're going next. Yeah. Is it a personal investment strategy to just chase what institutions are investing? Some people can do it. The problem is the time lag is that what you're seeing, and you can see their dates, some of these filings are from December. And there's a time lag between the time the institutions sell and the time they report to the SEC. So you might be buying because they're buying, but they might sell before you know it. And then it's really too late. But, you know, a lot of people will actually mirror Berkshire Hathaway's portfolio because uh, they publish it. You know, same thing. You, there's a friend of mine who's a Harvard Business School professor who basically wrote a paper. Well, he's now an MIT professor. He got kicked out of Harvard for not publishing enough because he started a hedge fund and decided to work on his hedge fund, not his research. But you can't complain. He's worth you know tens of millions of dollars now. So he's, he's, don't feel bad for him. He ended up at MIT. <clears throat> but uh, in any event, um, what it, one of his papers he wrote when he was still at Harvard basically said, if you just mirror the uh, investment portfolios of big funds, you can actually do pretty well. So he actually said, follow that strategy. But you got to pay close attention to exactly what they do when they do it. And if you're not paying close attention, then you're not mirroring their strategy. But uh, you can basically do it with lower fees because the problem they start running into when they get too big is they start having trouble finding places to manage their money. So they also said there's a problem with big funds in general. But back to this. So... <clears throat> what I wanted to really say as a main point is the institutions are going to be the price setters because they control most of the stock. And it's a few people who are doing the same process that we are. We're all doing DCF. So what we're trying to do is get insight into their assumptions. Now, there's a sell, there's a sell side analyst that work for the banks. They're doing the exact same thing. And the sell side analysts, <clears throat> so again, I can go to the ANR. I can look, these are the analysts that are covering them. And so here's this guy, Mark Schwartzberg. He's got a hold, works for Stifle. 
And if I click on this, these are all the companies that he covers. Okay. So basically, here's Mark's phone number. Here's his email address. There's his office address. By the way, I've actually had students in the past call these analysts. About 45 seconds, they'll ask who you are, and then they'll hang up on you when they find out you're a student. So they'll start talking to you until they realize you're a student, and then they'll hang up on you. So don't take it personally if you try and contact them. But <clears throat> basically, because that's his real phone number, like he'll answer that phone if you call it. Um, and then basically, that's his email address. But, but here's the point. This guy probably makes about $750, which is like a little bit above minimum wage in New York. You can probably afford about a 1,500 square foot apartment for about a million and a half in New York right now if you're actually a decent uh, analyst. And your mortgage is very high, and basically you don't want to lose your job. So one of the things that Mark has to be good at is predicting stocks, because otherwise he's going to lose the $750,000 of your job, and he's going to have to go hunting for work. Right? And he's not going to want to work at McDonald's. So back to this. <clears throat> but here's the thing. Mark and the other analysts on that page that work for the sell side are doing the same DCFs we are. And the institutions, like Berkshire Hathaway, are paying attention to what the sell side analysts do because we're all looking at the same data. We're all trying to come up with forecasts. The difference is these sell side analysts are publishing their forecast. All right, that's where Mark has to put his name on the line. Him and his team, he's probably got two junior analysts that work for him that do all the work. Matter of fact, if you look at, watch the movie Wolf on Wall Street, all right, the, at the beginning, now except for the cocaine, which... <laughs> You know, shouldn't happen on Wall Street anymore, though I've heard some interesting stories. But, but basically, when they abuse the people below them, like you're the ones that are getting the abuse doing all the work and they take all the credit. That's the way Wall Street works when you first get started. But basically, you're in a team of three people. You crunch all the numbers. You give it to the analyst. The analyst puts his or her name on the line. They're uploading it here into the database. And that's the point. They have a coverage universe. So part of the way that they're forecasting is they're not just forecasting Coke, they're forecasting all of Coke's peers. And they're talking to all of Coke's peers, which means they're triangulating data amongst the industry. So they're not just looking at Coke's point of view, they're looking at Pepsi's point of view and Anheuser-Busch's point of view and all those other companies' points of view when they come up with their forecast. So what I'm telling you is I don't think we're going to forecast better than they are because they do this for a living they have access to data that we don't. They have access to the companies that we don't. They go to all the industry conferences. Some of them sponsor the conferences that all the companies come to. They talk to the CFOs on a regular basis from all these companies, and they put their, their best guesses forward, and they don't want to be wrong. All right. So here's the point. That's why this screen, the earnings estimates, become so important. Because this consensus estimate is really the wisdom of Wall Street. And typically, in the short run, there's not a lot of divergence. Yeah. Um, is there a conflict of interest if, like, a sell-side analyst upgrades the stock to like an insane price target when they have clients that are trying to buy or that are, have already accumulated stock? Yes. Does that happen a lot? It's called Wall Street. Yeah. Wall Street lives with conflict of interest. Okay. So they 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 put up paper walls called Chinese walls. Yeah. that basically segregate out the conflict of interest. And for those of you watching in the video, I'm putting little quotations in mind. But, but basically, they live with the conflict of interest. That's, that's why there has to be so much disclosure on Wall why Street. why most of their price targets never get hit? Like, if they upgrade Tesla to $300, like it's not going to get hit. For like it's even worse because they'll upgrade it knowing, not that they're supposed to, that there's another side of the bank that's got a big por portfolio yeah, of that stock that they're trying to upload. Yeah. They're trying to offload that portfolio. Yeah, and that creates the demand. And they create exactly. Something. Yeah. So there's a game that's being played. you got to recognize that there's a game that's being played, and you got to pay attention. That's why the individual investor can really get screwed, because you, you do all your research, and you realize that the institutions are just playing games with themselves to make money. Matter of fact, that's the thing about the float. The float's important, too, because when these IPOs hit, they put such a small float on the IPO that there's such demand and such small supply that it spikes the, the price. And it's set to do that. And then the institutions sell into the price spike. So it's a way that they essentially mechanically make money by manipulating the price. 
but they can't admit that they're manipulating the price because you go to jail for stuff like this. So they basically break enough rules without getting caught. And the regulators kind of tolerate enough of this until you go too far. All right, but I'm just telling you, it's a game. It's rigged in the short run. In the long run, which is what we're focusing on here, this is intrinsic value. This is what the stock should eventually be worth. But in the short run, God knows what can happen. That's what I said. This is not about what the stock's going to trade for in the next 30 days. There's a lot of factors that can influence this. These models that we're using are predicting longer-term value. But that's the point. Even these analysts are predicting cash flows for longer-term value. This is a long way of getting to the point that I was going to make, which is when we forecast, which we're now getting into the forecast of Coke, we're actually going to use the forecast to help us that Wall Street has with our own forecast. Because we're not going to come up with a better forecast than the people that work on Wall Street. So therefore, we're going to use them to help us with our valuation. So here's what we're going to do. On the assumptions tab, the two most important things in the forecast, and this is on the EEO screen, on an annualized basis, are the sales and the operating profits. Right? Those are going to be the two most important elements to our forecast. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually, instead of trying to recreate it myself, for the next two years, we're in the most heavily forecasted, and probably the rate of standard deviation is probably not too great from what the companies are going to do. We're going to rely on those as our first two years in our model. So really, when we forecast 10 years, we're not going to forecast the first two years. We're going to use the consensus for the first two years, and we're going to focus on years 3 through 10. So in our model, we're going to add in sales 1, sales 2, Operating profit one, operating profit two. All right, <clears throat> so sales one. Sales one means first forward year, convention. Right, just like we did EBITDA one and we did the multiples. Sales one is forward year one, so in this case, 2014. For Coke, 46,894 is the current number. Sales two, 48,871. Operating profit one, it's 2014 operating profit. 11223 operating profit to 11933 so that is the current consensus and by the way I took a screenshot in the last class of the EEO screen and I posted it to canvas KO-EEO. You can find the numbers on there as well. But that is the current consensus for Coke. All right. So this is the point at which we're going to pause the video and then we will pick up here on Wednesday and we will finish off two valuations. We're going to do an as-is valuation where we come close to the $39 a share price. And then we're going to put in our final recommendation for what we think they're intrinsically worth over the long run. That's the process that we're going to finish up during the next session.